Okay, so how is everyone today? So, so uh, there's an exam in nine days. It's two Thursdays from now, two plus seven days. Any question about that? It'll be over quizzes up to and including six, which six is currently being grading, graded at this time. Any questions about that? I'm sorry, I just came in. Is that two Thursdays? Two Thursdays from now is an exam, the 26th. So, Thursday of next week. Right. Not, not two days from now, two plus seven days now, from now. I don't like to say next because, because everybody seems to have a different opinion about what next week means and what this week means. So I say multiples of seven. Are we allowed any um, general direction for the three that will be tested over? What they may be showing? Or is it uh, just si similar to what's been in, in lecture and, uh, and, and problem section. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, we're going to have to do that. That's icky, isn't it? But we'll deal. <coughs> Other questions? Yes? Uh, the ones that we want to redo, do all we need to bring? It's just the quiz and question number, is that it? Right. Okay. So, so there will be, by, by, by the time you've, so, so it's, over, it's, it's over quizzes up to and including six, but we didn't have a quiz five or something. So that's really actually five quizzes. And then there were three exercises on each quiz, because I'm not counting that. Well, did quiz one have three exercises or two exercises? It had three, but, but one of them was a was a nothing. So really, so really, you have nine exercises because I'm not counting that one. <laughs> so you, since there's nine exercises, I'll allow you to redo up to five, just over half of them. Yes. Uh, since we're going to be doing those three mandatory questions, two uh -huh. mandatory questions, what will those be answered in as? Will those be in another quiz or? Yeah, they'll they'll be like quiz number, and I'll just pick some big number like twenty. Okay. Quiz number 20, exercise one, two, and three, or something. Yes? Yes. Yeah, it's over, it's over the, the same material quizzes one through two. It'll be in this room during lecture. So it'll be just like coming to lecture, except you'll be taking an exam. Other questions? <coughs> Okay, so last time, last time we were talking about linear algebra, a little bit of review of linear algebra, and after, after going through that uh, lecture and talking to some of you after the lecture, it seems to me that some of, that, some of that's still a little bit spotty and questionable, so we're gonna do that just a little bit more before we move on to um, the, the, the calculus that, that is a consequence of that. So generally, uh, <coughs> So one of the concepts that seemed unclear was this concept of, uh, what, what's today, the 17th, yeah, that's right. Uh, this concept of surjectivity, injectivity, and bijectivity. So it might help a little bit if we take it away from calculus and linear algebra for a moment and just consider uh, the following. So if we have a function, uh, and I'll just do it with points and arrows, if the domain is 1, 2, 3, 4, and <clears throat> the range is, say, 5, 6, 7, then I can define a function from the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4 to the set containing 5, 6, 7 by drawing an arrow saying, if you were to plug in a 1, a 6 would come out. If you were to plug in a 2, uh, a 7 would come out. If you were to plug in a 3, a 5 would come out. And if you were to plug in a 4, then say a 6 would come out. Okay, so I'll say that this, this is, that the name of this machine this function is f. So the word surjective, injective, bijective, what, what is this thing? Surjective, 
This is surjective. But not injective. So F is surjective. <coughs> F is surjective. And what is the synonym that you might be more familiar with? Onto. Onto. <coughs> because there is an arrow. Or let's say it like this. There is a way to reach all of these. things in the range. You can reach any one of them. None of them is left out. And what that means in terms of equations, therefore, you can solve <coughs> solve f of x is equal to y for all y. So for example, I could say, well, can you can you please solve this equation? f of x is equal to 5. Well, then x must be 3. OK, can you solve the equation f of x is equal to 6? Now, so now there's a solution, but, what's, but what, what notable thing has occurred? Yeah, there's more than one solution. So, uh, it, so you could have that x is, what are they, 1 and 4? So surjectivity guarantees the existence of solutions. It means you can always solve. Uh, but it doesn't make any guarantee about uniqueness. Right? Because here, it so happened that, that for this specific equation, the solution uh, was unique. But for this other one, the solution was not unique. So <clears throat> that's surjective. Uh, if instead <clears throat> we do something like this, uh, say 1, 2, 3 is the domain. And then uh, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then I give a, <clears throat> I give a, a mapping to say, well, if you, if you were to input 1, the output would be 6. If you were to input 2, the output would be 7. And if you were to input 3, the output would be 4. So now, if we name this rule G, just to give it a different name, is G surjective? Why is it not surjective? You can't input that Right. Not, not everything over here is reachable. You can't reach 5. So in terms of equations, that means that for this specific function and for this domain and range, not all equations are solvable. What's an equation that is not solvable? g of x equal to 5. So g of x equal to 5 is not solvable. So this, this function that, that we drew, g, is not surjective. <clears throat> but it is the other one. What's the other one? Injective. injective. It's injective. And <clears throat> in <clears throat> how can you tell that it is injective? <laughs> right. So in, the, in terms of outputs, every output is reachable in at most one way. So this one is every output is reachable in at least one way. At least one is surjective. This one is every output is accessible in at most one way. So in terms of equations, it doesn't guarantee that a solution exists, but it does guarantee what? That solutions, when they do exist, are unique. That's what it's saying. <clears throat> so for example, what if we ran the machine twice, that we were standing over here? This is a big machine, and here we are standing over here. And on the other side of the machine, we can't get on the other. We can't see the other side. Uh, but suppose that we witness two outputs. Suppose that <coughs> uh, we witness two outputs, uh, and say that the two runs were someone put an x1 in, and we saw something come out, and then someone put an x2 in. 
and we saw the same thing come out. So we, say, we saw the same output twice. Then what do we know about the inputs? The inputs must have been the same. That means that the person on the other side put, say, a 3 in, and we saw a 4 come out, and then if we saw a 4 come out again, they had to put a 3 in again. Okay, so <clears throat> that's injectivity. Now, as far as counting is concerned, as far as counting is concerned, <clears throat> uh, because there were three, uh, sorry, four elements in this one and three elements in this one, there are more elements over here than over here, more, element, more inputs than there are possible outputs. Then, as far as surjective and injective is concerned, F has only, the only hope that F could possibly have as far as objectiveness, which one could it be? Surjective. It couldn't possibly be injective. Why could it not possibly be injective? Right. And so in, in discrete math, there's a name given to this. The pigeonhole principle, right? If we're going to have an arrow leave everything in the domain, if, we're, if you like, if we're going to put all four of these things into three boxes, then there's got to be at least one box with two things in it. That's the pigeonhole principle, or it's also called the box principle. So I could, I could edit this f and make everything become a 5. Then this function would be neither injective nor surjective. Okay, now, for the injective example, notice that the number of things in the, in, the number of inputs is less than the number of outputs. As a result, this could not possibly ever be what? Surjective. We could not possibly ever cover everything in the range. There's no way you could hit all four of them if you only have three inputs. This is, again, just the box principle. Okay? <clears throat> so, this, this, supposing that the number of inputs is three and the number of, of outputs over here is four, we could never make it surjective. But it could possibly be injective, and it is. But if I were to, if I were to edit this G, and I were to make all of them become a four, then this, would, this G would be neither one. It wouldn't be surjective or injective. So <clears throat> when, you're, when you have both, that's bijective. So this is a continuation. So when it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, we have some function H. So if I was to take all of the inputs and, put them, and give them all to four, then it wouldn't be injective or surjective. But if we do something like this, <clears throat> then is it surjective? Yes. Every output is reachable at, le at least once. Is it injective? Yes, because every output is reachable at most once. So every, every output is reachable exact, exactly once. Okay, so such a thing is surjective. That means, in terms of equations, that means that, that this equation is, that every equation is solvable, and furthermore, it has a unique solution. Okay, so, so now, a lot of these things are kind of obvious because human beings come equipped with some very significant uh, counting mechanism in our head. Like the box principle, I think, is more or less innate in, in human beings. It doesn't, you can, you can teach it to a child, and it doesn't, they're, they're not surprised at all. Uh, but it, things do get a little bit messed up. Uh, if, if you permit yourself to have um, infinitely many things. So, <clears throat> to, to make the point uh, clear, Suppose that we have, so the name, the name for this thought experiment is Hilbert's Hotel. Suppose that, <clears throat> suppose that uh, we have a hotel and, the room, and people like to stay in it and the, ru the rule is that every hotel is allowed, uh, every room is allowed to have zero or one people in it. You're not allowed to share any rooms. And furthermore, if there is an open room, the, the, the manager or whatever is always going to to let, to, 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 to let out the room. So suppose a green person comes and says, can I have a room? What's the answer? Yes. 
The answer is yes. The first room is open. You can go, you can go right in. Go ahead. Okay, then, then suppose a blue person comes. And the blue person asks, can I have a room? What's the answer? The answer is no, right? No, because the rule is, is that you can't share any rooms. Okay, this is, this is entirely obvious. Okay. Now, suppose that instead of having four rooms, suppose that we have the same number of rooms as there are natural numbers. That is to say, for every natural number, there's a room. And uh, suppose that all but the first room is full, has, has a red person in it. <coughs> that one's kind of indifferent right there. <laughs> okay, so that, so that all, all of these rooms, so dot, 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 are full except the first one. And suppose a green person shows up and says, can I have a room? Then what's the response? Yes. The response is yes. Come on in. So now every room is full. They're all full because the first one has a green person in it and all the others have red people in it. So now suppose that a blue person shows up and asks, can I have a room? What's the answer? Yes. The answer is yes, of course you can. Because I'll just get on the, if I'm the manager, I just get on the phone and say, everyone, I need you to move down one room. <clears throat> I need you to move down one room. And then supposing that we do that, Right, if you're in room 100, then, you're, then your new room is 101, right? It's fine, it's no problem. So now the red people are here. <clears throat> the green person is here, and the blue person is here. Incredible. So why did this trick not work when there were four rooms? Yeah, that one would have fell off the end, right? That one would have fell off the end. It couldn't have worked. This works. Now, do you, can, can you agree that this would work if any, if any finite number of blue people showed up? If 100 blue people showed up, I would just get on the phone and say, everyone, I need you to move down 100 rooms. Then the first 100 rooms would be open. Okay, and if that's not disturbing enough, let's consider the following possibility. Let's consider that, that we're back here before the blue person shows up. The first room is filled with a green person and all the others with red people. And then suppose that, that, this, that infinitely many blue people show up and it's the same number of, of people as natural numbers. So there's a zeroth blue person, a first blue person, a second blue person, blah, 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 all the way down the line. So we can't use the same trick here because I can't get on the phone and say, everyone, I need you to move down infinitely many rooms. Because the person in room three would say, what, what room am I supposed to end up in? Right? Because infin infinity plus three is not a number. Right? That's, and so that's not a room. So you can't just say, just, go, just move down infinitely many rooms. So what if infinitely many blue people show up? Can, can you? Can you fit them all in? Yeah. Do you know how? Ah, but the question, you, you, no, I'm just kidding. Right it couldn't work. That wouldn't work because you wouldn't be able to say you are eventually going to be in such and such a room. Yes? Yeah, you just get on the phone and just say, everyone, take your room number and multiply it by two. So if, so if you're in room 100, your new room is 200. So that means that now only the even rooms are occupied. <laughs> oh, and that means that all of the odd ones are open. Now all the blue people start filing in. Okay. What, now, what, what if infinitely many groups of infinitely many blue people show up? Can I just this absurd? Does it still work? And now the question is maybe. It depends on how you've arranged these infinitely many groups of infinitely many blue people. If you've arranged them in such a way, the answer is yes. If you've arranged them in some, some possibly different way, then the, answer, then the answer is it depends on whether or not you accept the axiom of choice. But what I want to point out is that isn't this a little bit weird? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a little bit weird. No. No, it's not weird. How do you get this? So, what I want to point out to you is that you could take the naturals, and then you can consider the strict subset, the set of naturals which are even. There's the same amount. You could, take, you could take all of the naturals and consider the strict subset all of the naturals that are divisible by a million. The, num the quantity of naturals that are divisible by a million is the same as all of them. So that means that that's a bijection. Okay, that's disturbing. So now, uh, what's even possibly even more disturbing, also by Hilbert, uh, also by H Hilbert, is that you can consider the unit interval and you can make a function which goes to the unit square. And you might ask yourself, well, are there more, more points or are there less points in the unit interval than in the unit square? It's going to be the same. But if it is the same, then you should be able to show me a function that's a bijection between them. Say this one is that one, that one is that one, <laughs> that one is that one. Because to say two sets have the same number of elements is to, is to, is, is to provide a, bij a bijection between them. Okay, so if, if, if we were to count the number of people in here, and it, and it turned out to be exactly, say, 51, then that would mean that we could take the numbers 1 through 51 and say, you're number 1, and you're number 2, etc. And that's what it means for there to be 51 people in here, is that we've set up a bijection. So, is there a bijection between the unit interval and the unit square? Of course there is. <laughs> of course there is. Uh, and if you want to figure, if you want to look that up for further reference, because we don't have time to talk about it, the bijection that will do it is called a Hilbert curve <laughs> by the same guy. Very clever. So the, the disturbing thing I want you to observe about this is that the dimensionality of the unit interval is dimension one, and the dimensionality of the unit square is dimension two, which is to say that you're making something one-dimensional have the same size as something two-dimensional. That's quite disturbing. Okay, then, <clears throat> as if that wasn't disturbing enough, if we made something dimension one become something of dimension two with a continuous function, would it be possible to make something of dimension one that has a dimension that's strictly between one and two? Sure, why not? So an example of, of this, uh, you could take the unit interval and you could map it into, the, into this so it's, not, so it's not onto. And you can arrange matters so that the resulting object has any fractal dim fractional dimension that you want. So you might have heard of a fractal. For example, the Mandelbrot set. The Mandelbrot set has fractional dimension, I forgot what. So something like one point. That must be something like the logarithm of two or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, like one plus the, what would it be? It'd have to be one over the logarithm of two or something like that. So the reason why they're called fractals is because as a shape, they don't have an integer dimension. They have a fractional dimension. So this is really disturbing. So I'm giving you these disturbing things because now that I've hopefully scared you just a little bit, I'm going to bring us back to the safe space of linear algebra. Okay? So the safe space of linear algebra. Yeah, why, why not? <clears throat> yeah, I like that. <clears throat> I already did the I already did the Christmas Halloween joke, right? No, I didn't. All right. So, if you take the number 25, the number 25, and you represent it in base eight, okay? Then, so this is 25 in base 10. That 25, the normal 25 that you think about. But if you want to represent it in, in, in base 8, the way you count in base 8 is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, 
16, 17, and then 20. <laughs> I got it, it hurts me to do it a little bit. So my my question to you is is how many eighths can you take away from 25? Three eighths. So. And when you take away 3 eighths, what remains is 1. So that means that 25 represented in base 10, uh, 25 in base 10 is the same as th 3 and 1, 3 eighths and 1, 1 in base 8. And sometimes instead of writing the subscript to denote the base, sometimes you write these letters like, uh, you know, 10 is called decimal. So decimal 25 is the same as octal. 31, <laughs> and this, this is why mathematicians can't tell the difference between Christmas and Halloween. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so, fine, a diversion. <clears throat> okay, so when you have a linear map, When you have a linear map, you're still, you still have this injection, bijection, surjection thing going on. We're still interested in all of these because linear maps are just functions. But the counting argument no longer becomes a counting of points. You're no longer counting points, or at least you don't have to. Because in the case of linearity, all, what, you're actually, what you can actually count is dimension. And that's what the rank nullity theorem is saying. It's saying that. <coughs> Suppose that we have a linear uh, T that's going from Rn to Rm. <coughs> then instead of counting individual points, like this point to that point, this point to that point, this point to that point, you can count individual dimensions. And so, I'll try and explain this by way of example. So suppose that we have a T that goes from R2 to R2. Then the dimensionality of the domain is, uh, is 2, and the dimensionality of the range, or the codomain, which is what it's usually called in linear algebra, is also 2. So what I want you to imagine is that we take all of the basis vectors for the domain, and stack them together, you can, you can construe this as being the identity matrix. So that is to say E1, then E2, and then going all the way around. And suppose that we, we feed this as input into the T function. And suppose furthermore that what we witness come out, we put in this two-dimensional object and suppose that we witness a second two-dimensional object come out. So we put in the, the unit, the, the orthonormal basis in, and then we witness this two-dimensional object come out. Then what's the rank of T? Two. It has rank two. What's the biggest rank that T could possibly have? Two. two. Because of linearity, you're allowed, to in, you're allowed to give inputs that are of size dimension at most two. So it, linearity can't, cannot increase the dimension, so the rank of something that, that does this is 2, and what's the nullity? Zero. 0. What if instead you put in the unit vectors to the T machine, and what you witness come out is, say, just a one-dimensional object. So you put in a, you, you a two-dimensional object, and you map it linearly, and it becomes a one-dimensional object. Then what's the rank? This is rank one. And what's the nullity? One. So that is to say, in a sense, one of the possible degrees of freedom, one of the dimensions was preserved, but one of them was destroyed. So you lost one. So that's what it means. The no you, you, you kept one and you lost one. Then suppose we do it like this. We say, OK, let's try a different T. This is, you know, I guess I could call this, this is a T, this, this is one possibility, another possibility, another possibility. Suppose we do this, we put in a two-dimensional object, and what we witness come out is just this zero-dimensional point. Then what's the rank? Zero. And what's the nullity? 
It's two. What I want you to observe is there's a counting game going on here. What must be the sum of the rank and the nullity? Two. The size of the domain, and that is to say the dimensionality of the domain. You have a question? Um, yeah, I'm just not sure I remember this correctly. So nullity is the <coughs> dimensionality of the null space? That's right. It's the dimension of the null space, or kernel if, if you so use like that name. A x equals zero. It, yes, it is, it is the, it's the dimension of the solution space to t x equal to zero. Yeah. <coughs> yes? Right. Yeah, it's like saying how much is it being squished. So, you know, we could take you as a three-dimensional object, right? And if we were to put you through a linear map, if you got squished flat, but, but two-dimensional, <laughs> right? For example, my hand is, is in fact not flat, not really, but it's being projected onto that screen. So that means that what's the nullity of the projection going that way? One. And what's the rank? Two. It's ranked two because you can see the image of my hand is two-dimensional. But because my hand is in fact three-dimensional, I'm losing one dimension doing this, so the nullity of the projection of my hand is one of that particular projection. Okay, good. <clears throat> so any question about this? Okay, so now, this, because of this counting argument, is it possible that such a map could be injective? Yes, that is possible. That is possible. Why is it possible for such a map to be injective? So let me, let me give you a counterpoint. It might help to see a counterpoint. So here's two. Suppose that we have a map T, which takes R3 to R2. So how is this one, how is this one different than the previous one? Right. So, could this one be injective? Yes. It could be. Could, could this one over here be injective? Yeah. It's not possible. It couldn't possibly be injective. Because the inputs are size 3, dimension 3. And if you put a three-dimensional input into a linear map, you couldn't possibly get anything of higher dimension. And furthermore, because we're going to a two-dimensional space, the output is necessarily two-dimensional. So you're going to be squishing things. You're going to be squishing things. Could this be injective? No, there's no way it could be injective. How about this one? Could this one be surjective? Yes, it could be. So over here, I, in these three possibilities, which one is surjective? The first one is surjective. It's surjective because it's the only one that has a two-dimensional output. This is not surjective because this has a one-dimensional output. You couldn't reach everything. And this is, not, this is even less so, I guess, you might say. Which one is injective? Still just the first one. So, <clears throat> in this case, this, is, this one is injective and surjective and therefore bijective. But none of the other two are any of them. None of the other two are, are, are injective or surjective or bijective. Okay, because remember that in, for, for, for linear maps, uh, a linear map is injective. It's injective exactly when its kernel is trivial, or if you like, its null space is trivial. It only contains the origin. So that is to say that something is injective, a, a, linear, a linear map is injective exactly when its nullity is zero. This is the only one with nullity zero, so this is the only one that's injective. Okay. <clears throat> so now, we're giving three-dimensional inputs. So, little box here. <clears throat> and suppose we give a three-dimensional input to the T-machine. What's the biggest dimensionality that could possibly come out? Two-dimensional, right? Because we can't get anything bigger to fit in there. So, we could have a two-dimensional object come out. In this case, what's the rank? Two. two. And what's the nullity? One. one. Because one dimension has to be crushed, has to be squashed away. 
otherwise you couldn't get it to fit. Okay, similarly, I, could, I won't bother drawing it, but you can imagine I draw another one. Suppose a one-dimensional object comes out, then what's the rank? One, and what's the nullity? Two. Suppose a zero-dimensional object comes out, what's the rank? Two. What's the nullity? Three. Three. Okay, now, could this one be surjective? Yeah, this could be surjective. If, if you input the, the, all of the unit vectors and what comes out is a two-dimensional thing, it's surjective. It's reject, yes? Uh, for, the one, for the previous one, why aren't the other two also surjective? This is not surjective because what, what I'm saying is that this is the first basis vector and that's the second basis vector. And then the image of it, the image of the first and second basis vector are collinear. So the, the image doesn't span the whole space. So that is to say that this is sitting inside of two-dimensional space inside of R2. So this is a two-dimensional object that is inside of R2, whereas this is a one-dimensional object sitting inside of R2. How does that surjectivity mean that you can solve for each uh, of the thing on the right to, to know what? To yes. So, so, what, so to answer your question more directly, what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that suppose that the codomain, the range, is all of R2. This kind of thing, this kind of thing, its image will look like this. Which means that if, if I take my pen and I point right there and say, can you solve? The answer is yes. But if I take my pen and put it right here and ask, can you, can you solve? The answer is no. You can't reach this one. Okay. So this one, uh, this one is surjective. Okay. Similarly, <clears throat> suppose that I say three. Suppose that our linear map is from R two to R three. So now, could this, could this latest one that we're talking about, could it be surjective? No, it couldn't be surjective. No linear map could be surjective. Other maps of that are crazy and scary could be, like some variation of the Hilbert curve, you could get it to work. You could input a two-dimensional thing and then out comes a three-dimensional thing, but not a linear map. You couldn't do it. So <clears throat> what this is saying is that suppose that you input the unit basis, then you could, you could conceivably witness sitting inside of a three-dimensional space, you could witness a two-dimensional thing come out. In such a case, what's the rank? <clears throat> and what's the nullity? Zero. Zero. <clears throat> because remember, what has to be true about the, the sum of the rank and the nullity? It's the dimension of the domain. It's the dimension of the things being put in. Okay, <clears throat> good. So, any question about this kind of notion? Yes? Uh, why is R3 to R2 surjective uh, by the same explanation that you said that R2 to R1 is not surjective? That was R2 to R2. Oh, yeah. So, th this, e this is an example that is surjective. Uh, how, why is it But it's surjective because this is a two-dimensional object, and how big is, what is the dimensionality of the range of the codomain? Two. So this is a two-dimensional object sitting inside of a two-dimensional space. So it's surjective. You can, th you can think of it like this, that one of, the, one, of the one of the basis vectors got mapped to this one, say, and the other basis vector got mapped to this one. So that would mean that these two vectors, this one and that one, span the whole space. Who knows where it went? It just got it just got squished away. Because you're taking your it's a linear map from R three to R two. Yes? Uh, on number three, we go from R two to R three. Mm -hmm. uh, if we did end up with a three dimensional object, can we not explain the rank and all of it? It couldn't possibly be linear. Okay. There's no way it could be linear. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, that, that would be 
<laughs> in linear algebra, that would be that. This is this is the end times, right? Yes. Could this one? Could this one be injective? So, so is it? In, in fact, you can answer definitely for this specific example. Is this injective? Yes. 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 Because what is in terms of rank and nullity? What is in, what is injectivity equivalent to? Nullity is zero. Nullity is zero. What is surjectivity equivalent to? The rank is the dimension of the codomain. That's what surjectivity is. So. Because of rank and nullity, when you, have, when you have the same dimension inputs as outputs, when it's, say, for example, R5 to R5, and suppose that the rank is 5, then what's the nullity? Zero. So in the case of a square matrix, or if you like, a map from, from one space to the same space, R5 to R5, injectivity is equivalent to surjectivity. They're equivalent. They're exactly the same. So when you have a square matrix, injectivity is the same as surjectivity. So injectivity is the same as bijectivity. And surjectivity is the same as bijectivity. So square matrices which are injective, or square matrices, square matrices that are surjective, or square matrices that are bijective. These are all so important that we deigned to give them even another name. What's the name for square matrices that are bijective? Invertible. <coughs> These are the ones. Invertible. That, because what it's saying is that you can turn the map around. You can turn the arrows around. And you can go the other way. That's what invertibility is. So, <coughs> when you have T from Rn to Rn, so notice that it's N and N, both, both of them. then injective is equivalent to surjective. So that means that not only can every equation be solved, supposing that this is true, that either one of them and therefore both of them is true. If you can solve equ an equation, then you can solve it uniquely. That's what it means. That's what it means. So <clears throat> this is equivalent to invertible. That is to say that you can always solve this equation. Tx is, tx is uh, y. You can, it, it is well defined to say that x is t inverse of y. And then, supposing that T <coughs> is given by a matrix, so if the matrix of T is, say, the matrix uh, M for matrix, because why not, <coughs> then you could take this matrix, MX, is, uh, sorry, that X needs to not be in there. is y, and if m is surjective, therefore injective, therefore bijective, therefore invertible, we can move the m to the other side by computing its inverse. Okay, so now, from linear algebra, would someone please remind me of the procedure to compute, give, given a, a square matrix that is invertible, how do you go about computing its inverse? Do what? Okay, that'll get you a long way to doing it, but yeah, that crazy thing would work too. But I'm fishing for something else that starts with A. Create an augmented matrix with an identity and that's reduced. This one, the, the augmented matrix thingy, blah, blah. Okay, so do you remember that? So to do it, to compute, to compute M inverse, you take you take the coefficients of m and you put them right there, and then you take the identity, the n by n identity matrix, and put it right there. Is, this, is that what this is? Okay. So, it, 
I don't know all the, na the names that are, are used in your linear algebra class. So good, that's what I mean. So you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on M and also keep track of all of those operations that you're doing to I. And the result, <coughs> after you do a sequence of operations, you'll now have I in the left position and what will be in the right position? A inverse, <coughs> uh, sorry, M inverse. So keeping track of all those elementary matrices, et cetera. So you can do this, this, ignoring all the stuff that I said. One of the main concepts and results from linear algebra is that doing Gauss-Jordan elimination, when you can get from this point to that point, so what, whatever it is that's right there, if you can get from point A to point B, then M is necessarily invertible. And its inverse is whatever's right there. Okay. So, in principle now, I could give you, if I gave you, <coughs> pardon me, any equation uh, that was from Rn to Rn and linear, then you could solve it using this thing that you already knew. Okay. <coughs> so, what if, what if it was uh, Rn and, uh, what am I trying to say? What if um, you have an injective map, but it's not surjective? So if we have a linear map that's injective but not surjective, then what must be true? Right. It's, 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 you're, you're inputting, say, three-dimensional things, but the output is being spit into a five-dimensional space or something like that. So the input size is less than the output size. Okay. <clears throat> So injective, but not uh, surjective. So <coughs> suppose that it's like this. T is, say, Rn <coughs> to Rn plus k. And suppose, furthermore, that this is injective. OK. So. Where, where solving equations is concerned, what does that mean? Yeah, it means that you might not be able to solve. You might not be able to. But if you can, then what? It's going to be unique. That's what it's saying. OK, so how do you determine whether or not it's possible? If, if I was to give you a specific matrix, say if the matrix of T matrix of T is M. And suppose that I want you to solve, <coughs> if possible, MX is equal to Y. It, it doesn't mean that there is a solution. But as far as computation is concerned, how do you check whether or not there is a solution? Oh, no, not eigenvalues. This is way, way beyond. Okay, you, you could check. You could, you could check. Is Y in the, in, the, in the span of the columns of M? But this just begs the question. How is it that you do that? <laughs> right? How do you do that? Right. So what I'm trying to get you to say is that you do exactly the same thing that you did last time. You do exactly the same thing. You form the augmented matrix, M, and then you put Y right here. Put M and Y. And now you perform, you all call it Gauss-Jordan? Okay, now you do Gauss-Jordan. Okay, you're doing it according to the coefficients of M, but you're recording it also with Y. Okay, now... <coughs> Uh, because, because there's the input size is n and the output size is n plus k, that, that means for, for one thing, m is not, is not uh, square, it's rectangular. So what is, the, what is the maximum number of pivotal ones we could possibly achieve? n, right? There could be n of them. Okay, there couldn't be more than n. 
If we got all n, that would mean that, that, that m has full rank. It could, it could possibly have less than n. So if you arrange matters, if you arrange matters so that if you permute, no, we don't even need to do this part yet. So when you do this, when you do Gauss-Jordan elimination, what you will observe, yeah, so you, you can make it to where uh, you'll have a whole bunch of zeros. How many, how many rows of zeros will you have? You'll have k rows of zeros. And then you'll have n rows where they're not all zero. So you'll have something like a one and then a bunch of zeros and then some stuff and then a one and then some zeros and some stuff. And you can have up to n of these, <clears throat> n pivotal ones. So when you do that and you're recording all these things with y, you're recording all these things with y. How can you tell whether or not y is in the columns is is in the column span of m? If you do have n well, even then it might not be. What what must be true? So this is where we're gonna, this is where we're recording what happened to y. How do you tell? You have to get zero right here. If you got anything that's not zero right there, you couldn't possibly solve for this y. That would be like saying, suppose that you've got a plane tilted in space, in free space. And then we're mapping, we're mapping say, the xy plane into three dimensions, so two into three. If I select a point that happens to be on that plane, you'd be able to solve. But if I select a point that's off the plane, you wouldn't. And you'd get something that's not zero right there. So if this is zero, then you can solve. If it's not zero, you can't. OK, good. So that, there's, there surely is a name. So this, I'm, I'm not getting good bites on this. This is, this is sounding mysterious. It seems, it seems like it's mysterious to you. Uh, surely they use the word consistent, right? It, that, that's a word? Okay, so then this system is not, is not consistent. If, if this is non-zero, then it's not consistent. You wouldn't be able to solve it, which is to say that this particular y is not in the column span of m. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, so now here's the question that we really need to solve, the linear question. Suppose that we're doing this. Instead of putting something of size n into a bigger space, like mapping R2 into R10, instead of doing that, let's do it the other way around. Let's map something big into something small. So like something like R, let's take R5 and map it into R2. What if we were to do that? So Rn to Rn minus k. So an example would be something like R5 to R3 or something. So now, could this map be injective? No, it couldn't be injective. Because you're taking five dimensional things, and the output is at most three dimensional things, so at least two dimensions are getting squashed. At least two. It couldn't possibly be injective. Could it be surjective? Could be surjective. Could be surjective. <clears throat> so suppose. that T is surjective. Then how many pivotal, how many pivotal ones will there be? <coughs> so for this one. How many pivotal ones? Got to be n minus k, right? Got to be n minus k because it because that's the dimensionality of the of the range. <clears throat> so there's got to be n minus k of them. Now they could be spread out all over the place. So what I mean to say is, 
for example. <clears throat> Suppose that we're doing specifically this case, uh, that we're doing A is, that we have the, the matrix is uh, so this one, three by five. Okay, so we've got a, a three by five matrix. And suppose that we do uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination on it to get it into, uh, y'all call it, y'all have a name for it when it's, okay, good, reduced row echelon form. Okay, so then it might look like this. So we'll, we can always arrange it so that we've got a one here and then zero, zero, and then maybe, maybe, uh, who knows what that is, and then a zero, zero, and then this one is something, and then here's a one, and here's a zero. So that's, how many is that? One, two, three, four, and then like this, say like this. <clears throat> one, two, three, four, uh, and then these are whatever they are. <clears throat> so this one is after reduced row echelon form. So there's got to be, um, <clears throat> there's got to be three pivotal ones. What I'm saying is that to make our lives easier and to make it to where what I'm going to say is more understandable, I'm going to say let's sort, let's sort the, uh, the x variables, let's resort them, so that that causes all of these columns to be in a row, so that, so that we get just the diagonals, we don't have any skips. Okay, so do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that... <clears throat> We want to sort the variables so that it looks like this. <clears throat> Oops. So this one could go here, this one here, and this one here, and then the others can go wherever you want. So if we were to continue uh, the elimination so that the, so that the leftmost block is the identity, uh, we'd be able to do it, right? Because, because we have three pivotal ones. Right. That cur currently it's not. But what I want you to uh, remember is that you could continue further and get this, uh, get this to be uh, the identity if, if, if you continued. <coughs> Okay, so how do I know for sure, how do I know for sure that I can get these ones to be all lined up like that? What's the guarantee that I could do this? Okay, I agree with that. And what, what uh, fancy word am I fishing for? What does that mean, the number of? Surjective, right? The surjectivity of, of the map guarantees that we'll be able to do this. So suppose that we've Suppose that we've sorted it like so. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so specifically, <clears throat> so affect this sort so that it looks like this. And now write. <clears throat> that M, the matrix M, is equal to the following matrix, P, and then N. <clears throat> P and then N. So that is to say that we, we sorted, we sorted the, the variables so that <coughs> this will row, will row reduce so that we have ones on the diagonal. All the pivotal columns will be right here, and all the non-pivotal columns will be right here, which is why I called this P for pivotal and that N for non-pivotal. <clears throat> so now, what, what uh, is the size of this? That is to say, how many columns are right here? N minus K, right? <clears throat> and then how many are right here? K. And then how many, how many rows are there? How many? In, in minus K. 
Okay. <clears throat> so now, let's say, so, so this, this part is square. So now let's consider Uh, let's consider that we want to want to do the following. So, will this equation m uh, z equal to zero? Will this have any solutions besides the trivial one? Okay. So it'll definitely have the trivial solution that z is zero because all linear all, all, matrix times zero is always going to be zero. Right. So when we're doing this, the nullity is at least is has to be at least two, and because we're said that it's surjective, that means it's exactly two. So that means that if we're if you're considering this, if you're use, holding this in your head, then this then the solution to this would be two dimensional. Okay. And then generally, if we're looking at this one, R n is going to R n minus k. What's the dimensionality of this? It's going to have dimension. However, however many dimensions we squashed. How many dimensions are we squishing? K of them. So this uh, will be k-dimensional. <clears throat> so that is to say the solution set. Now write that z, vector z, is <clears throat> y x, so the concatenation of, of two vectors like this. And specifically, <clears throat> specifically, I want y, I want y to be the first, uh, what, n minus k variables, <clears throat> and I want x to be the last uh, k variables. Okay, so then I, uh, so this is after we've sorted it to make sure that this happens. So, <clears throat> then I want you to consider this equation. Matrix times Z equal to zero. Well, because we said we're, we're factoring the matrix in this way, into block format, to where the first square part is P, the pivotal part, and the, the last rectangular part is rectangular. <clears throat> this equation is the same as P in, because that's M. And now we've, we've also separated the variables Z into Y and X. And this is equal to zero. But when you have, <clears throat> when you have block when you multiply block matrices, you do it in the same order, but, but with the blocks. That is to say that we can take this, uh, this equation, that's a matrix, that's a matrix, that's a vector, that's a vector, and you can multiply this out matrix fashion and get what? PY plus NX is zero. So let's have a sanity check. So PY plus NX is equal to zero. So did y'all do block multiplication in linear algebra? No. A little, little spotty. Okay, I promise you that it works, yes? So are we saying that P is just by the end matrix that we're reducing all bounds to just? It's, it's not. So, so what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that M, we took M, this is after it's, after you've done Gauss-Jordan. So I'm saying that after you've done Gauss-Jordan, take M and modify it and take it back to like this, yes? So Gauss-Jordan is where you put the identity matrix on one side and you put the inversion, the inverted matrix on the right side. So this would be reducing to upper row echelon. Okay, then you all call it reduce. Uh, Gauss-Jordan is where we made the inverse. Like we put identity on one side and then okay. this appears reduction in upper row echelon. Okay, so let's, let's say that this is, this is the reduced row echelon form of M. So notice that the pivotal columns are not all side by side. So what I'm saying is now, now go back to the beginning of the problem and sort, resort the variables so that all of the pivotal columns would be side by side. And do that to M. So once, you've, once you have done that to M, now block, block it in this way and refer to this part as P and that part as N. 
So supposing you've done that, now we're going to re this block has, is a square block of, si of size n minus k by n minus k, and this is a rectangular block. Now take the variable z and consider the equation that, tell, that you could solve to compute the kernel of m and block z in this way. Then you get this equation. So here's the thing about this equation is can you solve for y? This is the question I want to ask. Can you solve for y? Is it possible to do it? So, in the first place, I think we can agree that we could get it to here, right? Py is negative nx. So we can agree to this much, I think. By the way, do, these, do, the, do, do the matrix dimensions all agree? What's the size of this one? n minus k by n minus k. And what's the size of this one? In my, uh, it, it's, it's an n minus k vector, so this works. Okay, and the result would be n minus k. Uh, this is of size k, and what's the size of n? It, n minus k by k. So, so these are all in agreement, right? No, no, no offense has been made. So the, my question is, can you solve for y? It's equivalent to asking whether or not p is, is invertible. Is P invertible? It is, right? It is because we specifically said that P is you take all of the pivotal columns and put them all side by side. That means that this is the part that is invertible. Can you invert P? Of course you can. And the magic word here to, to make it possible to invert P is that the matrix M was surjective. That's why we can make P. So y would be, how do we solve for y in terms of p? Mm -hmm. Very good. So negative, and then on the left, p inverse n x. So what I want you to observe, what we did, what we constructed today, <coughs> is that we solved for some variables y in terms of other variables other variables x and we did so within the kernel of M. Okay, so now, how many variables are represented by X? K of them. K of them, right? So what we're saying is that, is that inter these these uh, n minus k variables can be represented in terms of these k variables. Yes? Uh, so since we have uh, matrix P, why are they different than matrix N? They're not evenly splitting them. They're not evenly split. Not necessarily. But they will always be defined in terms of multiplying them? Or would that only be Well, let's have a look. I mean, if, if, if you're concerned, let's have a look. So this is P is n minus k by n minus k, right? And what is the size of y? n minus k by 1. So is this part of the product defined? Yeah, that's defined. And the result will be n minus k by 1. OK, what is the size of n? n minus k by k. And then what is the size of x? k by 1. Now, what is the resulting size of this? n minus k by 1, which is, of course, the same as that one. So what kind of 0 is this? n minus k by 1. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> does that agree with this? Yeah, it does. So then you might be asking, it, does this matrix product make sense? Okay. By k by one, <laughs> right? So it works. Okay. So now here, the reason why I took the time to carefully do this, I, I want to remind you of two things. So on the one hand, let me summarize on a new sheet of paper. <clears throat> There's two problems, that line, linear problems, that we solve today. One of them is, is mx is equal to y. And supposing that this is bijective, that is to say invertible. So can you solve this one? The answer is yes, right? You just do this. <laughs> x is this thing. So a matrix can only be invertible if it's square. And in terms of functions, that's to say only if the input dimension is the same as the output dimension and it's injective, or same as surjective, same as bijective. Then the next thing that we solved is we said, well, what if, what if you have this equation? <laughs> what if you have this equation, that mz is equal to 0, and you perform the same factorization that we just did in, uh, sorry, p, in y x is equal to 0 when can you solve this when can you solve for y exactly when m is surjective if m is surjective then you can go through that construction that that we just wrote down by saying okay put all the pivotal columns on the left side that way p is going to be the part that's invertible then solve the equation in block format just like we did so, the reason why we carefully did this is because on Thursday, we're going to go over two major theorems. Th well, really three. In the first place, we're going to see how do you solve an equation if it's nonlinear, right? Because linear algebra is how you solve a linear equation. What do you do if it's nonlinear? Okay. <laughs> Hope and, you know. Uh, then the next question is, is, okay, what if we want to solve an equation where the input size is the same as the output size, but the equation is nonlinear. We're going to end up doing something that looks like this. Then, what if we want to solve an equation where the input size is more than the output size? Then we're going to be able to solve for some variables in terms of others, and it's going to look like this, except there's going to be calculus flying all over the place. And if I, I felt like if I didn't take the time to carefully show you how the linear problem works, that sprinkling in the calculus would have been a bridge too far. Okay, so we'll do that on Thursday.